Chapter 8. Why? A fair captive from the sky. The third day after the incubator ceremony we set forth toward home, but scarcely had the head of the procession debouched into the open ground, before the city then orders were given for an immediate and hasty return. As though trained for years in this particular evolution, the green Martians melted like mist into the spacious doorways of the nearby buildings, until, in less than three minutes, the entire cavalcade of chariots, bastonets and mounted warriors was nowhere to be seen. Solon and I had entered a building upon the front of the city, in fact, the same one in which I had had my encounter with the apes, and, wishing to see what had caused the sudden retreat, I mounted to an upper floor, and peered from the window out over the valley and the hills beyond, and there I saw the cause of their sudden scurrying to cover. A huge craft, long, low, and grey painted, swung slowly over the crest of the nearest hill. Following it came another, and another, and another, until twenty of them, swinging low above the ground, sailed slowly and majestically toward us. Each carried a strange banner swung from stem to stern above the upper works, and upon the prow of each was painted some odd device, that gleamed in the sunlight, and showed plainly even at the distance at which we were from the vessels. I could see figures crowding the forward decks and upper works of the aircraft. Whether they had discovered us, or simply were looking at the deserted city I could not say, but in any event they received a rude reception, for suddenly and without warning the green Martian warriors fired a terrific volley from the windows of the buildings facing the little valley, across which their great ships were so peacefully advancing. Instantly the scene changed as by magic, the foremost vessel swung broadside toward us, and bringing her guns into play returned to our fire, at the same time moving parallel to our front for a short distance and then turning back with the evident intention, of completing a great circle, which would bring her up to position once more opposite our firing line, the other vessels followed in her wake, each one opening upon us as she swung into position. Our own fire never diminished, and I doubt if 25% of our shots went wild. It had never been given me, to see such deadly accuracy of aim, and it seemed as, though a little figure on one of the craft dropped at the explosion of each bullet, while the banners and upper works dissolved in spurts of flame, as the irresistible projectiles of our warriors mowed through them. The fire from the vessels was most ineffectual, owing as I afterward learned, to the unexpected suddenness of the first volley, which caught the ship's crews entirely unprepared and the sighting apparatus of the guns unprotected from the deadly aim of our warriors. It seems that each green warrior has certain objective points for his fire under relatively identical circumstances of warfare. For example, the proportion of them, always the best marksmen, direct their fire entirely upon the wireless finding and sighting apparatus of the big guns of an attacking naval force, another detail attends to the smaller guns in the same way, others pick off the gunners, still others the officers, while certain other quotas concentrate their attention upon the other members of the crew, upon the upper works, and upon the steering gear and propellers. Twenty minutes after the first volley the great fleet swung trailing off in the direction from which it had first appeared. Several of the craft were limping perceptibly, and seemed but barely under the control of their depleted crews. Their fire had ceased entirely, and all their energies seemed focused upon escape. Our warriors then rushed up to the roofs of the buildings which we occupied and followed the retreating armada with a continuous fusillade of deadly fire. One by one, however, the ships managed to get below the crests of the outlying hills until only one barely moving craft was in sight. This had received the brunt of our fire, and seemed to be entirely unmanned, as not a moving figure was visible upon her decks. Slowly she swung from her course, circling back toward us in an erratic and pitiful manner. Instantly the warrior ceased firing, for it was quite apparent that the vessel was entirely helpless, and, far from being in a position to inflict harm upon us, she could not even control herself sufficiently to escape. As she neared the city the warriors rushed out upon the plane to meet her, 
but it was evident that she still was too high for them to hope to reach her decks. From my vantage point in the window I could see the bodies of her crew strewn about, although I could not make out what manner of creatures they might be. Not a sign of life was manifest upon her, as she drifted slowly with the light breeze in a southeasterly direction. She was drifting some 50 feet above the ground, followed by all but some hundred of the warriors who had been ordered back to the roofs to cover the possibility of a return of the fleet or of reinforcements. It soon became evident that she would strike the face of the buildings about a mile south of our position, and as I watched the progress of the chase I saw a number of warriors gallop ahead, dismount and enter the building she seemed destined to touch. As the craft neared the building, and just before she struck, the Martian warriors swarmed upon her from the windows, and with their great spears eased the shock of the collision, and in a few moments they had thrown out grappling hooks and the big boat was being hauled to ground by their fellows below. After making her fast, they swarmed the sides, and searched the vessel from stem to stern. I could see them examining the dead sailors, evidently for signs of life, and presently a party of them appeared from below dragging a little figure among them. The creature was considerably less than half as tall as the green Martian warriors, and from my balcony I could see that it walked erect upon two legs, and surmised that it was some new and strange Martian monstrosity, with which I had not as yet become acquainted. They removed their prisoner to the ground, and then commenced a systematic rifling of the vessel. This operation required several hours, during which time a number of the chariots were requisitioned to transport the loot, which consisted in arms, ammunition, silks, furs, jewels, strangely carved stone vessels, and a quantity of solid foods and liquids, including many casks of water, the first I had seen since my advent upon Mars. After the last load had been removed the warriors made lines fast to the craft, and towed her far out into the valley in a southwesterly direction. A few of them then boarded her, and were busily engaged in what appeared, from my distant position, as the emptying of the contents of various carboys upon the dead bodies of the sailors and over the decks and works of the vessel. This operation concluded, they hastily clambered over her sides, sliding down the guy ropes to the ground. The last warrior to leave the deck turned and threw something back upon the vessel, waiting an instant to note the outcome of his act. As a faint spurt of flame rose from the point where the missile struck he swung over the side and was quickly upon the ground. Scarcely had he alighted than the guy ropes were simultaneously released, and their great warship, lightened by the removal of the loot, soared majestically into the air, her decks and upper works a mass of roaring flames. Slowly she drifted to the southeast, rising higher and higher as the flames ate away her wooden parts, and diminished the weight upon her. Ascending to the roof of the building I watched her for hours, until finally she was lost in the dim vistas of the distance. The sight was awe-inspiring in the extreme, as one contemplated this mighty floating funeral pyre, drifting unwinded and unmanned through the lonely wastes of the Martian heavens, a derelict of death and destruction, typing the life story of these strange and ferocious creatures, into whose unfriendly hands fate had carried it. Much depressed, and, to me, unaccountably so, I slowly descended to the street. The scene I had witnessed seemed to mark the defeat and annihilation of the forces of a kindred people, rather than the routing by our green warriors of a horde of similar, though unfriendly, creatures. I could not fathom the seeming hallucination, nor could I free myself from it, but somewhere in the innermost recesses of my soul I felt a strange yearning toward these unknown foemen, and a mighty hope surged through me that the fleet would return and demand a reckoning from the green warriors who had so ruthlessly and wantonly attacked it. Close at my heel, in his now accustomed place, followed Ula, the hound, and as I emerged upon the street Sola rushed up to me as, though I had been the object of some search on her part. The cavalcade was returning to the plaza, the homeward march having been given up for the day, nor, in fact, was it recommenced for more than a week, owing to the fear of a return attack by the aircraft. 
Lurk was Tama was too astute and old warrior, to be caught upon the open plains with a caravan of chariots and children, and so we remained at the deserted city until the danger seemed past. As Sola and I entered the plaza a sight met my eyes, which filled my whole being with a great surge of mingled hope, fear, exultation, and depression, and yet most dominant was a subtle sense of relief and happiness. For just as we neared the throng of Martians I caught a glimpse of the prisoner from the battle craft, who was being roughly dragged into a nearby building by a couple of green Martian females. And the sight which met my eyes was that of a slender, girlish figure, similar in every detail to the earthly women of my past life. She did not see me at first, but just as she was disappearing through the portal of the building, which was to be her prison she turned, and her eyes met mine. Her face was oval and beautiful in the extreme, her every feature was finely chiseled and exquisite, her eyes large and lustrous and her head surmounted by a mass of coal black, waving hair, caught loosely into a strange yet becoming coiffure. Her skin was of a light reddish copper color, against which the crimson glow of her cheeks and the ruby of her beautifully molded lips shone with a strangely enhancing effect. She was as destitute of clothes as the green Martians who accompanied her, indeed, save for her highly wrought ornaments she was entirely naked, nor could any apparel have enhanced the beauty of her perfect and symmetrical figure. As her gaze rested on me her eyes opened wide in astonishment, and she made a little sign with her free hand, a sign which I did not, of course, understand. Just a moment we gazed upon each other, and then the look of hope and renewed courage, which had glorified her face as she discovered me, faded into one of utter dejection, mingled with loathing and contempt. I realized I had not answered her signal, and ignorant as I was of Martian customs, I intuitively felt that she had made an appeal for succor and protection, which my unfortunate ignorance had prevented me from answering. And then she was dragged out of my sight into the depths of the deserted edifice.